everybody and thank you for joining us for um, another presentation in our day of IR webinars. It's fantastic and we're looking forward to this really good presentation from Zaza Handy, who's um, a senior um, consultant at NTT. I will let her introduce herself um, shortly when I hand over to her and she'll be talking about Rogue in the Mailbox. So I'm sure she will uh, uncover what that is all about very shortly. Um, so thank you Zaza for coming on and doing this presentation to today. But just thank before you. I hand over, um, just wanted to go through, if anybody has any questions at the end of this presentation, um, please feel free to pop them in the question pane. And I'm sure Zaza will be happy to answer whatever questions you have at the end of this. So thank you very much. I will hand over to Zaza and over to you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining the seminar, the workshop today, the webinar, sorry. Uh, the topic is rogue in the mailbox. We're gonna talk. We're going to we are going to be talking about the root cause, the impacts, and how to respond, and obviously prevent it happening. My name is Azla Handy. I work with NTT as senior security consultant uh, in the area of incident response. I'm also an intrusion and malware forensic uh, analyst. I do malware reverse engineering. I have done a couple of business email compromise over the years for different clients. I respond to malware, ransomware attack, you can see my head there, it's all covered on in encrypted stuff. So I, uh, I heard about the workshop and I said, what can I give to my friends and you know the industry? And I thought of this. When we mentioned, when we had the word rogue, everybody knows what a rogue is, somebody who is where they're not supposed to be, somebody who is doing what they're not supposed to be doing at the time they are doing it. So this is primarily on business email compromise. Now, let's look at the motivation. Why would someone penetrate an organization email infrastructure? Oftentimes, it's for crime, financial. I'm going to base it on the investigations that we have done so far. All of them were all based on money. Once in a while, you get the espionage type, but it's not very common. That's in the manufacturing industry or government. You may have others, but that's the kind of thing you're getting, Facebook type of investigation, like crimes of passion. But here, we are going to be focusing on the financial motivation. So what type of data attracts criminals to business mailboxes? You know, business secrets, customer data, the email, a lot of people think, oh, I'm just sending email, but we have done a lot of e-discovery over the years and most email infrastructure contain data, rich data, payment card data, even though they're not supposed to be there, but unfortunately we see this a lot. Partner data, their emails, their name, business discussions, health records, we've seen health records before when we're dealing with the health industry. Payroll data, employee data, and oftentimes very eye-popping gossips, you know, that will lead to litigation if it gets out there. So what am I trying to say now? There is reason for attackers to go after your emails because they got information that they can use to attack you and to attack your partners. So the two, I'm going to reference two case studies that out of the many that we have done at NTT. One of them, the attacker case study one, I will refer to that. It didn't, they didn't really own the mailbox they were able to obtain email address of the customer and use that email address with a fictitious a partner email. Probably the partner have already been compromised, which was the case here. So they were able to convince the finance team that they were the partner uh, of this company and got them to change account numbers 
and they were say, paying money to them that they were supposed to pay to the customer. So the second case study, which I find very, very interesting and quite offensive, is the actual rogue in the mailbox where the attacker is resident. They have access to the mailbox of one or multiple users. Initially, just like the previous one, it would be from phishing, the good old phishing. And the attacker, once they get access to the mailbox, they are able to do a lot of things. They, they were able to change mailbox rules. They were able to download the mailbox, read emails, send emails on behalf of the customer, and then again, try to convince partners and the client themselves to change account number so that they can commit fraud. Now, we always have a kill chain for everything, you know. Even COVID has its own kill chain. So for this, we have seen a pattern of that initial access, the credential theft. Credentials are so important, we know that otherwise we wouldn't be bothering locking our doors. So that credential theft, if that doesn't happen, most of the, the kill it will stop there. But once credential has been stolen, the mailbox is compromised. The attacker goes ahead to perform what we call e-discovery because they are business people. They don't want to waste their time investigating, trying to be inside a mailbox or an infrastructure or environment where there is really nothing to offer. And then they expand their scope. I will explain that later. From there, you get a man in the mailbox, yeah? That road in the mailbox because they are in between the sender and the receiver trying to convince the other that they are the other and then achieving their goal, which is primarily that financial goal. So initial assets that we have seen in our investigation, there could be others because there are many ways to kill a rat. So fishing, obviously we know 95 plus percent of most fishing, most attacks originate from that fishing email because of that social engineering, being a very powerful way to work on the mind of the individual. So brute force, they can brute force the credentials and also, in, as I mentioned before, other compromise means maybe the, they have downloaded the credentials from another means or even purchased it on the dark web. So, for example, when you look at credentials, this was a well-crafted email from a few, I think about two years or a year ago, we investigated. And I myself, I could have fallen for this, honestly, because this email is telling the user that the email they sent did not go through and that they should release it. So this is, you can see the, the, the link here included the name of the user, the email address of the user, so that they can know who they are dealing with. So that phishing email, it comes in. When we are talking about prevention, you find out that if you have a very strong spam filter on army of users who can detect this kind of uh, action, then it will not, the kitchen will stop there. So release email, most users naturally will not be pointing at that release email to see, oh, is he going to my office 365 or is he actually going to some dodgy website? So unfortunately this user, fell for it. So the main compromise itself, this is stage three, when an attacker gets hold of that credential, there are so many things they can do with it. Sometimes they just don't want to do it, they just sell it to other criminals to utilize. But the main purpose is to download that mailbox. They can download it locally. They can access that mailbox as much as they want, read the emails, delete the emails, so at this point, the mailbox is compromised. It's no longer, it has lost its integrity. And then enter the e-discovery. Oh, one of the cases we worked on, the attackers, they took their time searching for certain the keywords. They're looking for references to payment card, references to invoices, References to anything that has to do with money attachments. Why are they doing that? Because they're looking, they're following the money, they're looking for money. So you 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 find out that at this stage, if there is really nothing much to offer, they could just steal the contact, take the contacts available, and then target another person, like moving up the, 
the ladder or, or fatad. Oh, this person is not relevant. It's not even in an important group. What are the groups this person belongs to? I often we often find that they target people in finance teams, people who are handling money and, and that payment receivable account department. So that e-discovery is very important for them. And I, I can imagine the attackers will have different arms of people in the department doing each, the person who breaks into the account, the people who do the e-discovery. At this stage, from what we have found, we're no longer dealing with one client IP. We're dealing with multiple client IP, sometimes coming from different countries, trying to check this. It's very easy for them to download the mailbox and get what they want first. So, for example, this is after that compromise, you can see this person is trying to convince this person that, oh, up to now, you are not replying my emails. You now have our TT copy. So even the grammar is not what you expect in a corporate environment. Even me, as rude as I can be, I wouldn't be writing like that. So but again, the users are not able so most times to detect the telltale sign of a rogue in the mailbox. And then the other crucial thing that they have to do, and we have seen them do, is set up mailbox rules. So when we know what the motive of the attacker is and what they are planning to do, this can help us target our detection on what to look for. Sometimes it's very difficult to find this with everybody working from home, different client IP addresses from all parts of the world. So they set up mailbox rules and you know, if, if, I, if this person sends email containing this keyword, let me know, copy me, do that. We all know what uh, mailbox rules can, can do. And then they, they take uh, on more accounts. Like that. this is in the previous case study, that was probably how they got the customer, my client's email address. And then they went and registered a domain to match that domain and use that to start fishing them until they fell for it. So stage six, that man in the mailbox, if you look closely here, just ignore all the other noisy bits here, you can see the reply to is going somewhere, but the actual email, where it's replying to, you can see that DL, the DL.com doesn't match. So all these, you will find someone masquerading to be whom they are not. Again, here they achieved, they at this point, they, they have managed to get the email address, they know who is approving what they have looked, they have done their e-discovery, they have found those crucial invoices. Sometimes they get lucky, they see payment card details that are not even encrypted in Excel files. So for example, look at this one, they are trying to, we got this from an um, analysis string, the strings, the uh, memory strings of one of the PDF files uh, that was sent by the attacker. You can see the account number, trying to get them to change. And unfortunately, the, the customer actually made some payments here, down here. So they, they are already achieving their goals at this stage. Sometimes, as we often find out, in organizations where they have a robust check and balance when it comes to money, when one person approved, the other person said, oh no, hang on, when did we decide to change our account number or pick up a phone and call and then you see that it fails. So I've just run through an overview of what the attacker's motives and why they do what they do, how they go about penetrating the network and what they do once they get that asset. That could be other things they do. Some of them who say, you know what, just finding a credit card and invest is not enough for me. I might have said drop around somewhere here yeah, if I have access. Don't forget if they have credentials log into the mailbox, that credential can get them into the AD of the user account or the user's account. So how do we detect this? Now, disclaimer here, Zaza, I am not an Office 365 <laughs> mail administrator or expert, so it's based on what we have observed during engagement and oftentimes we we'll ask clients to tell them the logs they want and they retrieve it for us. So if you are an administrator, it will help you. If you are not an administrator and you're an incident responder like myself, uh, listen on and you can have some more knowledge. 
I've also included logs, uh, not logs, links to important Microsoft websites, uh, articles that can help you during this type of investigation. So the Office 365 uh, mail logs are your best friends. They, there you can have the basic audits and the advanced audits where you can retrieve all the data that you need to determine what IP address connected to was used to connect to the mail bus, what IP address was uh, the, the client that load the mail bus to, where was this change is made from. So if, but the primarily, I always, I'm a campaigner of baselines. If you do not know what is normal, if you do not know what is normal for your environment, how are you gonna know what is abnormal? So in one of the environment, this is what is normal for, for them. You see that users log in all the time. User, use, failed login is not very common in this environment. I mean, the users are quite good. New inbox rule. No, who, what is inbox rule, the user will say. Most users start their I look, I act, look, type their email, send it. Every now and then they change mail boss rules, like move my email from this important client to this boss. Yeah, they don't usually say, oh, forward it to this, I, this email address that is not in my company domain. So if you know your baseline, it helps. If you don't know your baseline, that's fine. So useful logs, on this link here, I have uh, documented uh, the link that you can go to, to obtain more information about Microsoft audit logs. You have the mail audit logs, which give information about one single user, unified audit logs for multiple user accounts. It has limitation of 50,000 per search. So you can construct your search like in dates, maybe from Monday to Tuesday, and then another Tuesday to Wednesday, so that you can get as much as possible out of it. Now, during our investigation, I found out recently that Microsoft have done really very well here. Uh, they, they added some forensic uh, at, uh, features to the uh, Office 365 um, investigation. But you do need to have an E5 license to be able to get the most out of this. So these are logs that enable you to determine where a mail bus was downloaded, where it synced, where like if somebody synced the whole mail bus when you connect a new client and all that. And also the buying data, who, what was read, the fact that say, an attacker was a rogue within the mail bus, what did they read? Did they have access to this? Now, this type of logs, they come in much, much later when you have now confirmed compromise and want to determine the extent of compromise. Again, I have put a link here the link here for this uh, advanced audit is something that is recently new, uh, but you do need the E5 license to obtain that. But oftentimes when our customers don't have the E5 license, we are still okay just using other logs, including the unified mail logs. Now, this I included is for those of you that may have access to the slide later. Apart from looking at the mail logs, you, things like VPN logs, event logs, web browsing logs, because the web browsing logs, proxy logs will be able to detect that dodgy phishing link that the user went to. Uh, this is why I'm a believer in whitelist and blacklist. If it is not required for business, then don't allow it. Everybody have their smartphones here now to use or to connect wherever they want to. So I will talk about recommendations later. No, so there are other logs that one can look at. Also in that Azure environment, you have the risky sign-in and the risky user options that you can check to see. It gives you like a pattern of what is going on there. That's for proactively looking at it. But during active investigation, you may not have all the time to be assessing and checking dashboards. So these are the additional logs that we normally look at. We we'll go for the EDR activity if we suspect there is malware involved. Because so as I said earlier on, the attacker may say, oh, I'm not finding what I want. So let me just throw that somewhere here to see if I can get more money from there. 
Now, if you are an incident responder or third party doing the investigation, you may not have access to the customer environment. The customer may not know how to go about all of this. So they do need to give you uh, this account access, the AD, Azure AD Office 365 Global Admin Account with the e-discovery admin, note the e-discovery admin. And then over here, you have links that will take you to the pages where you can obtain additional information, including some of these logs that we talked about. Now, example here, we extracted this uh, from one of our investigation and uh, you can see here, it will give you the actual time that it happened, the list of users, users logged in. In this under operation here, the operation could be any one of many. For example, here we have new inbox rule, user logged in, user logged in fails. So you can filter to determine what you want, but your target is on this client IP. So I will explain and you can find, you can look at the pattern to see why the client IP behavior and the client IP location is important. I am near Manchester now and email is coming into my mailbox and I'm sending emails. If my account is somewhere in Timbuktu or in, in, in Sweden at the same time, sending email as me, I'm not a witch. I don't think any witch have that capability to be in that multiple places within minutes. So these are the things that you have to look at. So indicators, as I said before, are normally from baseline, something that is not normal from, for a particular user from, for your, from your business perspective. See a lot of too so many logged in failure trying to log into the environment. Multiple client IP accessing one mailbox. Multiple client IP accessing one mailbox. Client IP accessing multiple, that is one IP accessing multiple mailboxes. Uh, yeah, so that these are very, you know, not normal mail access behavior. Suspicious mailbox rules. So when there are mailbox rules that are set up to forward emails to addresses that are not in your domain, you can actually block this. I'll talk about that during recommendation, just looking at my time to make sure that we don't spend too much time on any particular slide. So access from suspicious geographic locations. If most of, yes, users are working from home now, but most users tend to still live where they have always lived. People tend to live near their workplaces. They don't live like thousands of miles away. So if you look at the geographical location, you're getting a pattern of people you know, emailing, accessing mailboxes from an authorized account from locations that are not normal. And this is because you know you're normal for before. Even if you didn't know you're normal, if you see a lot of suspicious connections coming from Nigeria and you don't have staff living there, you don't have any partners there assessing your, assessing your email, then you have to have an alarm bells ringing. I'll talk about this later. And then partners receiving suspicious emails from your team. Remember, a rogue in the mailbox can send email on behalf of you. They have access to the account. So if you look at this now, this is a failed login chart. Um, forgive me because I'm not very clever when it comes to using very smart, smart charts. Actually, I think I should be arrested for this, but I know I will, you will accept. So this is, uh, you can see this account here. These are just various mailboxes. You can see down the curve here, everything is normal. You know, I log in, I have dodgy fingers, you know. My T-H-E comes out at T-E-H for people who know me. So it's, it's possible for me to make mistake once or twice. But look at that. Yeah, trying. This is a brute force type of attack. But when it's not even brute force, you may not see this. When, some, when I hand over my credentials, you won't see this type of curve. But during the investigation, once you have retrieved that log and you plot it out, you can now begin to find these users that have uh, this level. This is too much. You can see, count of client IP trying to fail this ATK many times. Multiple account access. So these IP addresses here, accessing, like this first one was able to access 
10 different accounts. That's not normal. And this IP address is what are they? This is where you take the IP address, you get intelligence, go on the open source, or if you have an intelligence fee, or you can contact company, your IR company like Entity to help you find more intelligence on the IP. All of these, when we check them, they were all dodgy because uh, some of them actually belong to security, you know, antivirus companies that used, a company didn't use that antivirus tool and the antivirus tool is not designed to be assessing and reading their emails. So a compromise have happened somewhere else. Now look at this, again, forgive <laughs> the color scheme. So this is one mailbox. Look at all the IP addresses. This was within a period of one, two days during the lockdown when somebody's supposed to be in one place and all these email mailboxes, all these IP addresses, client IP, we are accessing these accounts. So these are the things that once you retrieve these logs, you can investigate, analyze and get more information and confirmation. Now, mailbox rules, we all know what mailbox rules are. Uh, I took this from my little outlook. You know, you can change, you can decide to set. Once somebody have access to the account, they can do whatever they want. I think in Office 365, yeah, you have the one that the admin can set. So if the admin's account was one compromise, well, just uh, start praying. User account, they can do that. And don't forget, I means to say that during that e-discovery, they find out what account, what, whether that account is part of a shared mailbox, whether they have access to a share. So in two of the cases, we found that they just quickly identified that and they didn't bother with the user anymore. They started sending as that shared mailbox and they set up all kinds of mailbox rule. So again, remember in the baseline, look at our baseline here. They don't usually set up rules here, but then within a very short time, you have something like this going on. Something dodgy is going on. There has been a compromise, and there is a rogue in the mailbox. So I just included here this here for whoever may have the opportunity to look at the slides. These are just uh, different ways a, a mail forwarding can be set up, and also different ways that you can prevent, actually pre uh, implement a preventative control to stop that happening. Now, remember I mentioned that Microsoft have introduced some advanced mailbox forensics. So when you go on this site, you can read more on it. It's a PowerShell script. So for sync activity, you just multiple users uses this script here to query, you know, this is the date, the end date, give me all where the mail access type value is sync. So it will retrieve all of that and show you. This, as I said, is when you have established that there is compromise has happened. You want to know the extent you did download the mail, but because some, you need to determine the scope, you need to report to your, you know, legislative bodies uh, whether this happened, that happened. So you need to dig deeper. So this actually is very, very helpful. But then you do need to have that e e5 license for it to work. The same goes for the bind, like did the person read the email? What email did they access? Uh, did they read? Did they delete? Okay. So for the single user, we are looking at the search mailbox audit log. For the multiple user, we're looking at the search unified audit log. All this information is on the link here. Remember, Zaza is not an Office 365 administrator, but I have used it in my investigation and I find this article very useful. Now, Threat Intel is a very important part. I've mentioned this before. I'm not gonna talk too much on this. It can enable you to identify, because there are so many IP addresses, once you've uh, removed the duplicates, you can pass it through intelligence to find. If you find IP addresses that are known command and control IPs, that are known for spamming, surely you need to start uh, activating your incident response. This is actually also very good. Even when you don't have any, you don't suspect a compromise, 
But like many companies I know now, you are proactively checking your environment. Now, so all this uh, talk about attackers, you know, going into mailboxes, stealing data, and doing all of that, I've often asked myself, why, why do they do this? How do they get away with it? Where do they put the money? In one of the cases we handled, it involved how many continents? South America, Europe, and Asia. Yeah, but it all went, the money went to the banking system. I don't know how the government and the banks are able to allow this to carry on. So during one of the investigations, we obtained this from, again, the memory strings of one of the PDF files sent. You can see JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo. I'm not criticizing this uh, company, sorry, please. Forgive me, I'm just doing my job based on what I saw. Citibank, Bank of America. Oh, what is going on in America here? Bank of New York. So these are not, these are different banks that the attacker probably used to move their money. And they are not, in, it's not one person did this, it's a, it's a com community of people, different regions. They have departments all over the world that move their money. So once that money goes in, it's taken away. We were able to recover one of the uh, money from one of the banks. One, on one other case, we were able to prove that the attack started from a third party company. So the third party company paid half of the money. I didn't know what title to give this. I said follow, following the money. I think it's the wrong thing, but I just didn't know what to label it. But then there are well known business email compromise attack groups. In one of, my, in one of the cases, now, disclosure. I was born and bred in Nigeria, okay? And I'm a very street wise woman. You can't cut me down because I know who I am. So we found a lot of IP addresses coming from Nigeria. On the mail bus, we also found a lot of payment card details, payment, open payment, credit card, payment, debit card in large quantities in the mail bus that they were sending, you know, for one reason or the other. It's not compliant, but that's what they were doing. And my client said to me, well, do you think um, they would do anything with this? Uh, would they bother? I said, seriously, would they bother? My people are hungry, clever. They will use it, they will monetize it, they will sell it. Please do something now. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say this, but there are many, Business email compromise attack, but people from the African, West African region are well known for this type of attack. They before they, they used to try the malware. I mean, with, with this, you don't need malware. If somebody gives you their credential and you assess and then you search and get the data you want. So why are they succeeding? They are succeeding because most times we'll find that companies don't have a uh, Multi-factor authentication on you know, internet facing services like, like this. If you don't have multi-factor authentication on your Office 365, on your VPN, good luck with that. That's just a recipe for anything to happen. Ransomware, business email compromise, you name it. So I'm going to be rounding up uh, so that I don't bore you too much. With some of the recommendations we have made to customers and we continue to research better ways to do this. Now I'm checking my time again. Yep, all good. So, I don't know why this slide ended up like this, but I can figure it out. Once the, what you call the containment, the initial containment now, once you have found this compromise, begin to act. Stop access, you prevent the attacker from accessing the environment. Some companies go as far as actually stopping all emails. Now that can be overkill, but that could be what is needed. So change the password, the AD as your password, not just the user uh, uh, on the user mail, but just change the AD as your password. Disable compromise accounts and then Remove malicious, any malicious mailbox rules that were set up, you have to remove them so they stop receiving what they are receiving. 
block the indicators. These are the indicators I'm referring to. Like you've seen that phishing email, you've done the header analysis, you've identified the IP addresses where it's originating from. Sometimes we find even AS numbers have done investigation whereby all the IP addresses they belong to one or two AS. So those AS, I call them drug AS numbers. Yeah. That's why you have to work with your ISP to do that. Email addresses that are obviously they can change the email address anytime. Uh, they can change domain, but then it's it's more difficult to register a new domain and then so target that domain, like one of the cases where they set up a domain that look like the partner's uh, domain so that they can convince my clients to facilitate what they were doing. Now you may want to put the account under in litigation hold. Uh, again, I put a link here for you to read more on that, especially if you want to you know, uh, escalate to legal later or you just don't want anything to change, to be overwritten on that account so that you can get all the evidence that you need because you need to find out all the IOCs so that you can block them and share them with the community. That sharing is very important. If you do suspect that malware is involved, you need to isolate the endpoint. Unfortunately, the, because people are working from home, it's so hard. Sometimes even with the proxy implemented in headquarters, it's not going through, you know, the user is using their home DNS. This is why in the next slide, I'm going to talk about strategic uh, uh, means to, to prevent. Prevention is actually better than cure. Because if you can prevent it, it's better than letting it happen and containing it. Because once it's happened, it's happened. They've taken all that credential. They've taken all that user email address from your customers. And then you need to notify the appropriate authorities. Notify. Like if there were credit payment card, the shame of it, but you still have to notify. Because it's not just about your compliance. People's payment card have been stolen. If you don't act, they will use them. And then the people, you start getting charged back and then it becomes even uglier. Notify your bank, as I said earlier on, is sometimes banks are able to recover the money, but most times they say, where well, you put the money, you activated and transferred and authorized this transfer. We know we are not gonna help you. Now, strategic recommendation, obviously there will be other containment action. You need to follow your playbook for normal intrusion in addition to what has been mentioned. And strategic recommendations, that two multi-factor authentication is very important. It's not something that you can do while you're having an attack or where you've discovered a compromise, but it's something that you can implement as part of the next strategy to prevent this. It stops a lot of multitude of, of calamity in, in, in attacks, including ransomware that is coming via VPN every day now that we see. Take advantage of exchange online anti-phishing features. I put the link there. That's very helpful. Implement credential aware URL. I love this. I think Palo Alto has a, one of the, I'm not selling for them, I don't even know who they are. A, one of the features in their product whereby no matter how much that user punch and kick that keyboard, you know, they're not gonna drop your, your credentials where you said they will not drop it. So it's a very powerful feature, especially for when users are working from home. And also URL monitoring that the types of Z scaler where if they're at home and they cannot go through your network, they be, any browsing will go through that central place and still block what needs to be blocked. Control automatic forwarding, adopt, you know, continuous monitoring. That monitoring is very important. And we can't forget the education of users. It always starts with phishing. And apart from phishing, when they now penetrate and send that in email asking you to change your account number, seriously, Account numbers don't change like that. Educate your finance teams to know that this is very dodgy. And then conduct regular dark web search, credential search, because sometimes they don't just steal it and, and use it, they steal it and sell it so they can collect money and then commit collateral damage. I cannot believe it's the end of the slide. I hope I, I was able to communicate the little from the many investigations that we have done just knowing that when there is a rogue in your mailbox, your information is not safe. A lot of people store data in data center, in database, in all that, and they forget that that email is a treasure of information. It has 
literally almost everything. And we need to protect it. When an attacker in, in gets into it, we need to detect it on time and we need to act fast to limit the, the damage that they are doing. Thank you very much. That was really interesting, Zaza. Thank you so much for that presentation. And you're right, I think it's something that we kind of forget, don't we? That, you know, our email, we do it every day, everything goes on, and we kind of forget about actually protecting ourselves there, don't we? We think of the bigger mm -hmm. pictures, but, you know, um, yeah, we forget about that side. So thank you so much. That was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, now, if anybody has any questions, we've got Zaza here, so please feel free to pop them into the question pane and we can get them asked for you. However, if you do have some questions afterwards, please feel free to come into through to marketing at crest-approved.org. Um, and I'm sure we can go over to Zaza and ask for any questions to be to be raised there. I'm sure she will come back. As Zaza said at the beginning, we will have this recording available um, on the Crest YouTube channel. Um, and that will be with us, hopefully, within a few days. Um, and Zaza, did you say your slides were available for the attendees? Yes, yes, they are available because I put a lot of uh, links there for my people to use. Um, I feel like a mama all the time. I always like to give, you know, <laughs> and to give and to give until I have nothing to give. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, we won't keep taking, I promise you, but I, I am definitely <laughs> going to be asking you to come back and do another presentation for us. So, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. We investigate, we investigate a lot of things. So uh, it helps to share, you know, uh, information from the field, from the things that we are seeing. Well, oh, that is great. No, thank you. We really, really appreciate it. And I know our attendees will appreciate it as well. So I don't think we've got any questions for you. Um, so thank you so much for coming along today. And would you like to just say a last few words to our attendees before we wrap up? Yeah, so it's uh, brilliant that you were able to join. Remember what I said, lock it up. Multi-factor authentication is very, very important. Get hold of phishing. How do you get hold of phishing? A good spam filter, a good web control, web traffic control, and an army of users who are able to know that their grandfather's will is not in that email. If you do get attacked, please escalate to your DFI company. Uh, NTT, we, that's what we do every day. We are very supportive and have empathy for when you do have these attacks. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Oh, that is great. And thank you so much for doing the presentation. And thank you so much for our attendees for coming on and listening today. Um, so take care. All have a really good rest of the day. We still have another presentation um, shortly in about 30 minutes. So please feel free to join us on that one. So take care, everyone, and have a good day. Bye. Bye.